Good afternoon and evening, everyone, and welcome again to another Dress and Drinks. Um, I am so glad that you were able to join us tonight. Um, uh, and so we want to thank you. Everyone from the Costume Society of America wants to thank you for joining us in this webinar and in our series conversations on dress. So today we are going to welcome to us from the Honolulu Museum of Art, uh, Tori Latila, curator of textiles and historic arts of Hawaii in the textile collection of the Honolulu Museum of Art. Prior to this position, Tori worked as the registrar with the Honolulu Mayor's Office of Culture and the Arts and Assistant Curator at the Hawaiian Mission House's Historic Site and Archives. Before starting his career, Tori studied art history with a focus on historic costume, gaining his bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His interest in historic and vintage costume began long before his university days. Inspired by his love of vintage, Tori also learned to sew. With his skill, he created vintage-inspired pieces in the face of limited garment choices in his size. Once he entered college, Tori discovered the study of historic dress. After leaving college and entering the workforce, he made his way to his current position, uh, where there is a limitation of jobs pertinent to costume and clothing on Oahu. Tori has been drawn to the role of curator of textiles and historic arts of Hawaii. He previously established knowledge of those who once held his position and the collection solidified the Honolulu Museum of Art as a perfect fit for his professional progression. In addition to his study of textiles and costumes, uh, Tori is an avid lover of vexilo vexilo vexillology. That's a tough word to say. Uh, the study of flags. Uh, so Tori, I'm so excited to welcome you here. Our cocktail this evening is of course, the Mai Tai. And a great shout out to Anne Was, as usual for our alcohol-free alternative, the Sneaky Tiki. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming. We're excited to talk with you today. Okay. Um, and it's only the afternoon for me, so I, I do have my, my um, non-alcoholic Mai Tai. I am at work, and my work is adjacent to a work room, so it's in my sippy cup. So I'm going to briefly go over um, what's at the Honolulu Museum of Art in Textiles and really focus on, on clothing, since this, this is our... CSA. Oh, my mouse is okay. So uh, I'm at the Honolulu Museum of Art, and we are located in the capital of Honolulu. We are located just outside of downtown Honolulu. And we were founded in 1922 and opened in 1927. And we do have an encyclopedic collection. When the museum opened in 1927, we had about 400 uh, textiles. And our founder, Anna Rice Cook, uh, helped establish the museum. And uh, we opened in 1927. And when the museum opened, we had about 400 textiles. Today, we hold about 6,500 textile works. Oh. Um, in 1975, we had a keeper of the textile collection appointed. And that was Rachel Brandon. She became the curator of textiles in 1983. She retired in 2003. And 2007 is an important year for the textiles at HOMA. Um, previously, textiles was only a part-time department. So uh, in 2007, uh, it became a full-time department and the textile collections manager, Sarah Oka, became the textile curator. And then she retired in 2019 and then I took over from her since then. Excellent. That's fantastic. Thank you. So um, we are a kind of interesting museum. We, we're, we have 29 galleries with a lot of various outdoor spaces. And uh, you can see some of the courtyard areas. So you actually walk through these various courtyards and then you go in and out of galleries. So you oh, can't wow. go through galleries while staying indoors. You actually have to go out outdoor spaces and back to the indoor spaces. And we have uh, uh, a Chinese uh, Chinese courtyard, a Mediterranean courtyard, and then we also have a central courtyard with, which actually has a, a large green space that we use for outdoor activities. And we also have an art school, a theater, a cafe, and of course, gift shop. 
Wow, that's gorgeous. Okay, so as far as textiles, we do have textiles spread throughout um, the museum in our different galleries. And so um, in one of our galleries, Gallery 2, we do have right now a tapestry and a chasuble front. And so um, those actually just went up last December. We redid that gallery and put in some textiles. Um, so hopefully the, the well, the chasuble will change um, on a regular basis. And it's just a kind of variety of, of our collection. What year is the chasuble from? The chasuble and the tapestry? Is, oh, the chasuble, let's see, um, 15th century, it is Spanish, and it's actually only the back. Um, yeah. Oh. Back, when I was preparing uh, the chasubles for exhibition, um, I opened up the drawer and as I, as I went through the many layers, I had like a very, uh, uh, almost a movie experience. One of, the, one of them, uh, the off-red gold was so intact, it, it was like brilliant, it was shining up at me. Wow. Uh, but uh, this one is just, just the back of, of one of them, but we will rotate them through. This one's 15th century Spanish, and then the tapestry is uh, circa 1480 Flemish. In our China gallery, we do have a couple of cases that we will, we will rotate textiles in. Um, I try and focus more on, on robes and some other garments. So we do have um, some late 19th, early 20th century um, men's robe and a woman's jacket. The upper right hand corner is a woman's jacket. And, then, and the gold is so brilliant on, on these court robes. I mean, it's usually a gold wrapped thread that's couched down in the various patterns and designs of, of whatever the motifs are. They're just very brilliant and you know they just really shimmer and 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 glow with gold how many uh in our previous discussion you mentioned that you have actually quite a large or a good collection of chinese court robes how many do you have in total uh close to 100 court garments together yeah. wow yeah so we do have a, a lot of men's jackets um some women's jackets we do have some skirts and then a few other accessories. Yeah, from for the textile collection of 6,500, about um, the majority is from Asia. So a lot of Chinese, Indonesia, and, and Japan. Now in our upstairs gallery, we actually um, when it opened, I believe we have we were probably the only um, museum to have a gallery dedicated to the arts of the Philippines at the time. Oh wow. And so we continue that gallery and it does, uh, we, we do rotate works in there and I do try and focus on pina cloth. So um, the last rotation, we did put up an image in the upper left-hand corner. You, there's two blouses from the Tiboli region of uh, the Philippines. And one is cotton, so, uh, early 20th century. And then we have a late 19th century one made of abaca. So it's similar in cut and style, but you know the abaca is very, very stiff compared to the cotton, which is much softer. But they all have the geometric motif. I have two questions for you. Um, for those in the audience who may not know our language, can you please elaborate on baka as well as pina cloth? So pina cloth, um, it's very gossamer. It's very lightweight, almost translucent. And it is made from a, a pineapple plant, a species. And the leaves are actually stripped down and the individual fibers are tied together and then that's the thread of the filament. And so if you'll see like the uh, the shawl and the blouse, you know, it's very kind of diaphanous and that's made out of pina cloth. And then abaca is made from um, the banana leaf. And so it's much stiffer. And um, abaca is the lighter weight one. And then cinnamé, which maybe some of the milliners out there are more familiar with, is the stiffer one. It's almost like a, a stiffened raffia. Oh, wow. Cool. They're all plant, plant fibers. Then we also have the Arts of Hawaii, one of our other galleries, and um, we do put textiles on exhibit. Um, usually there's a piece of kapa or Hawaiian bark cloth, as well as a Hawaiian quilt. On the right side, you'll see a uru motif, and this is the first time we put the Hawaiian quilts back in the gallery for a while. And so by tradition, when you when you learn Hawaiian quilting, the first quilt you normally do is a uru or a breadfruit. And the symbolism behind that is that it'll nourish you to help you uh, help you grow in the craft and continue to continue quilting. So, hence the ulu for the the first new quilt in the new case with the with the uh, new quilt mounts. That's a stunning quilt. It's uh, it's absolutely stunning. So the next one, the the last the last rotation is actually a lehua 
quilt. It's very stunning. Mm -hmm. Um, but that because we have them under glass on slant boards, um, some of our more delicate quilts can come out for an exhibition, which is really good. And what is the textile in the other side, in the other window? That, that is a kappa. So in the previous slide, it was a kappa moi, which is a bed cloth, which is about five layers of fabric, and the top one is decorated. Um, this one is just a roll of, uh, not just, but a roll of kappa by a contemporary artist, and it's um, by um, Marie Lelihua McDonald. And she was actually a well-known kappa practitioner as well as a lay, a flower lay maker. I mean, she wrote the book on making flower lay. It's almost like her color chart. So she grew the plants to um, make all the dyes. And so each of the sections have a, a different colors, a different dye from a different plant, which is a- Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. And then I think this was promoted uh, in CSA recently. We have an Islamic gallery. We currently have a few Islamic textiles out. Just fun to just put out a few other things in, in some of our galleries. And I was really inspired by seeing the uh, LACMA's uh, exhibition on, on Central Asian textiles. And that kind of inspired me to take a look at our roads in the collection. So we have Turkey, Syria, and Uzbekistan represented in this gallery. Um, and so that's that's most of the areas that we have um, uh, textiles on ex exhibition right now. And I know amongst my colleagues, you all do love a vault shot so um, we do oh tori you're such a flirt we do love a vault shot <laughs> this is fantastic how large is your vault the vault is just about 800 square feet and it, it is separate so our collections are separate so there is a dedicated textile vault it's adjacent to the textile workroom and then my office so i actually have a little room within the workroom and Here's one view of the workroom where we're, where we're preparing textiles, and it's about 600 square feet. So it wow. does allow us to do work. So, you know, we do prepare, or I prepare the textiles for exhibition in the space, and we can also do wet cleaning. So we actually will set up space and have everything running, and we'll prepare all the textiles in the workroom, which is actually right off to my left. If I move the camera, you would see that room. What a lovely space. It's a good space. It is in the basement, though, so there there is some concerns about being in the basement. But it is nice to have the office, the workroom, and the vault all connected together. So I know people usually ask, "What's the oldest thing in the collection?" And and we do have some Coptic tapestry fragments from the fourth and fifth centuries. That's just these little anthropomorphic remnants of of the weavings. Yes. And wow. Some of our newer acquisitions. Um, in 2015, my predecessor, Sarah Oka, put on an excellent exhibition called Harajuku Tokyo Street Fashion. And it's really a time capsule of, of that era of Japanese streetwear. And we ended up with about 120 some works in the collection, most of them acquired directly from the designers. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I love these. That is so fantastic. So besides Coptic textiles, 21st century Japanese, Japanese street fashion, I also get to have fun with contemporary art. So we have a Dwayne Hansen sculpture titled Secretary, and it is hyper-realistic. Um, you know, he was known to cast real people and clothe them with found objects and then um, variety of, of scenes or tableaus. And we have one in, in the collection that was um, scheduled to go out for an exhibition in uh, 2021. And you know, she was in the vault for a while and she needed some work. So we ended up taking her apart. They said, Tori, we'll go take a look at the take a look at the objects. And so um, we disrobed her. Um, so she sat in my office like this. And I have to say she's much more friendly looking without her clothes on. I didn't, we didn't take her underwear off. I mean, the, the last thing, you know, it is from 19, 1972. So we, I kind of left that intact, but the, the realism stops just past the clothes. So once they're off, you know, you, you really feel that uh, she's not a real person, but when the clothes are on, it's, they're very haunting. It can be very haunting. And um, because we had enough staff to take her off, take the clothes off, we basically lifted her up entirely and took, disrobed her. And then I found out later that he was, she was actually sewn into her clothes. So um, 
and the seams are open and the artists, you know, slip it on and so on because she's rigid. It's fiberglass. The legs oh, yes, yes. do not move. Um, but it was fun. We we uh, we uh, took the sculpture apart. Um, local textile conservator Linda He worked on the blouse and the skirt. We did get a few replacements. We did work with the estate, so we did replace her hosiery and a watch band, and then we cleaned all her other plastic parts. But here's a fun video of us um, putting her back together. So she she was stuffed with like napkins, like found napkins from a restaurant and other things, and so. We put back in, you know, our archival tissue and and whatever else we could, and <laughs> the clothes are coming back from from the conservator. And you know, she you get she gets dusty, and her hair is actually uh, glued into the resin. So we gave her a blowout, you know, blow done with no temperature and and a little dusting, uh, and then slowly putting on the hosiery. And you know, it's not easy to find. Uh, the appropriate period hosiery anymore. No, it's not. And then you know, many hands to put everything back on. And, and like I said, the, the, her blouse was actually open and re on the side seat, but there were enough of her that we could actually lift her up and slide her clothes back on. So um, it was a very fun and re rewarding project to have everybody get together and put her back, put her back together and and um, she has a steno pad, and in her steno pad uh, was a note. It was actually folded up and tucked away from a previous gallery, and it was written in cursive in, in first person um, about moving between galleries, and it was signed, Love Greta. So we all call her Greta now. That's, that's her name. That's fantastic. Yeah. Did you replace the note? Uh, the note is actually back in there, yeah. So, so I, 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 there's a few pages of written um, shorthand, and I think the gallery had switched pages depending on, on where she was, but the note was actually tucked into the steno pad and we left it in there. Yeah. But we all refer to her as, as Greta. Because um, Dwayne Hansen did cast off, um, real people as his model, you know, models for the figures, but so we don't know who the real person, who the actual model was, or if the model was actually a secretary. We don't know that yet. So. But no, it was fun and, uh, you know, polishing shoes, putting it all back together. And they really were found objects. Her wristwatch is actually a toy, a child's toy wristwatch from uh, Germany, post-World War II. So clean up a little bit of the metal and replace the band, find an appropriate source in Germany. And put her all back together. And um, clean her glasses, tie them up, and there she is in the gallery, all ready to take uh, take a letter. That is fantastic. So, how long did your um, refurbishing and conserving and and dusting take? It was over a two month period, just a little over two months. Yeah. Hmm. So take her apart, send out send out some of the um, the, the garments, and find replacement. Work with the estate, and then put it back together. So over about a two month period. Um, and and I, that was such a great video of showing you um, putting it back together. You know, anybody who has dressed a mannequin at any time in their life know how difficult that is. Um, <clears throat> Or you know any of our colleagues who are in the um, in the audience who do mounting professionally, they know what challenges those are. But especially when something is so rigid and it doesn't move, you have to find very interesting and unique solutions to it. Yeah, we use a lot of tissue. The fiberglass was a bit rough, so we would you know put tissue down as we put the clothes on and re remove the tissue as the barrier, so we wouldn't um, scratch or tear anything. Yeah. I loved seeing the inside, like under the arm, that not painted and unfinished, and uh, uh, that's really fascinating because you don't get to see that sort of mm, behind-the-scenes quality of an artwork like this. Yeah. yeah, she's quite hollow, but when you look at the hands and the face, I mean, even the veins are drawn in, and then it just, right after, you know, three inches past the clothesline, it's just rough um, fiberglass. How much does she weigh? 
Uh, I know I should never ask a lady her weight, but I'm very curious. Oh, I, I, I'm going to say, well, with without the chair, she's probably maybe 35 pounds or a little less. Oh. Yeah, not, not that heavy. Not that heavy. No, not at all. I mean, she's fiberglass, but um, uh, I was wondering if there was any weight that had put in to help her be balanced or stabilized. Um, there, there is a there is reinforcing probably some kind of uh, structure. I couldn't tell. It's probably wood underneath her seat, and mm -hmm. just, she just kind of sits into the chair. So yeah, mm -hmm. and it's a real chair, and she just sits right in there. But yeah, there's. There's some kind of a platform built into her on bottom. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. okay. So when I first started at HOMA, I was the curator of textiles and fashion. And then just about a year ago, they asked if I would take over the arts of Hawaii. And so coming from 19th century uh, historic site previously, I was comfortable doing that. And I'll show you one of my favorites in the collection, which is actually not a textile piece, but it is a work of art, and it's from 19, 18, 1856, and it shows the interior of the fort of Honolulu, which is roughly um, just out or where our Honolulu Harbor is, and if you know Honolulu, it's where Aloha Tower is, so right on the waterfront in front of the tower, and the Honolulu, the fort of Honolulu was like the government center for the first half of the 19th century, with like the governor's office and the jail and the armory and the courthouse. And I was working on a project um, with the city and county of Honolulu on a um, sculpture, and they wanted reenactors. So another part of me is is living history and, and reenacting, and so they wanted to do a ceremony, and I was tasked with recreating the uniform of the troops of the fort of Honolulu. And there's mm -hmm. lots of images that show the the tunic or the jacket and the trousers, but it was hard to tell about what the hat. This one showed a blue tip and a red band. So in 2018, we recreated the uniform of the troops of the Fort of Honolulu for the dedication of the sculpture you'll see um, in the back of that. And that was on July 31st, 2018, which is also known as Restoration Day or Hawaiian Flag Day, uh, which goes back to a pivotal time in Hawaii's history in 1843. So that was a very, very fun project for me. Tori, you're 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 touching on all of the elements of CSA in this presentation. Like seriously, living history, yes. Um, and so I'll just mention a few other favorites. I do um, like some of the royal regalia, and we do have Aula in in the collection. So that's the feather cape. These are the shorter ones, and so they are worn by Ali, and and they do have different meaning and symbolism, as well as um, cultural protocols and rights and and how we we transport them. That the colors have different. Uh, levels of hierarchy, and uh, the one on the left with the um, uh, heart heart shapes are um, roughly from uh, the 19th century, and that's actually from the uh, Ka'alalea family, um, which is with the Ka'alalea family, which were um, part of the ones who over who submitted the um, petitions against the annexation of Hawaii in 18. Uh, late 1890s. So we have a lot of these historical connections. And I also have been studying um, Hawaiian dress in the 19th century, particularly when I was at Mission Houses. And I'm picking that up again now, I'm working with our collection. And so lehulu or feather lei are also another symbol of royalty. And this one was owned by Queen Kalakua. And she was one of the widows of Kamehameha I. So when the missionaries arrived, the American Protestant missionaries arrived in 1820, um, there was already a lot of interchange in Hawaii with goods and products and textiles. And Queen Kalakua went aboard the ship when the missionaries arrived and said, make me a dress. She commanded the missionary women, the first Western women to have known to have come to Hawaii, said, make me a dress. And so that's the origins of the holoku, which later proceed with the mu'umu, the Hawaiian national dress. And so we actually have the lei of the queen who said, or who said, make me a dress, which is the origin of the Hawaiian dress of Holoku and mu'umu today. So I'm working on the exhibit that will come out in the future. But oh, I do have some images. that's fantastic. 
the images of, of women. So this is 1816, 1817, and you have a woman on the left, and she's already wearing a blouse, like with a little ruffled collar and sleeves. And Western women are not in Hawaii yet, but we have Hawaiian women wearing Western clothing. And she is of royal status because she does have the lei, um, lei, lei nihuo palaoa, which is the um, hair and um, pendant. And, wow. you know, it was it was a status symbol in Hawaii to wear Western clothing in the early early contact era. So, you know, you have men that might wear one thing. I mean, there are stories of, of, of men wearing just maybe a top hat and traditional clothing or a coat. And so here we have a man in a tailcoat and a woman in her wrapped towel, which may or may not be bark cloth or um, introduced fabric. Um, and are the decorations on his legs, are those tattoo work? Is that tattoo. body or scarification or tattoo? Tattoo, tattoo. Yeah. And so there's different symbolism as far as wealth or, or some of them will commemorate a date or a death of somebody. So. Um, but we do have some sketches in the collection, and this one is showing uh, Kamehameha the second. And there's actually a note in the bubble. It's in it's in 19th century cursive French, so that does take a little deciphering. Um, but it's talking about what the king is wearing. He's wearing a uniform, but it doesn't talk about the queen. But the queen is probably wearing like a late 18th century dress with the panniers, and maybe without the stomacher because the the V has just ruffled. And so Hawaii is on the route where you have a Chinese export wear, where they would make dresses for the European market, weave the fabric, make the dress, and then ship them to Europe from China. And so I believe she's probably wearing one of those export wear dresses. So just looking Fascinating. at- Fascinating. That's really interesting. Um... And the other people who are in uniform, and then some just uh, in draped clothing, uh, really interesting. Yeah, so you do see some of the visiting French officers as well as um, the king's officers and then the rest of the court at the feet. Yeah, but so I'm, besides the introduced work, I'm also looking at like the holoku and the muumu, where, where that comes from and or where, it's, where it goes to. Because the muumu was originally the undergarment of the chemise for the holoku. The holoku was the, the full dress with long sleeves, mm -hmm. and the muumu was the shorter chemise. Um, that ended up eventually being worn by itself. But I'm just like to look at all these little drawings. Like this one, I think it's like three inches square. It's just a little drawing from the 1860s. Oh, wow. Where you see Hawaiian women in Hawaiian dress of holoku, but in the back you still see um, native dress. And this kind of leads into kind of the exporting of, of Hawaii, um, where you start taking this idea of old Hawaii and you develop this uh, idea of paradise and um, exoticism, hence our Mai Tai for this evening, which means very good, by the way, you know, Mai, mai Tai is a corruption of Mai, mai Tai or Mai Tai, which means very good, because how does the drink taste? The drink tastes good. Um, so I'm looking at that, but in our collection, we also have some the very, very first printed al Aloha fabrics. Wow. So the Aloha shirt starts in the 1920s, which, and it uses um, imported fabric from Japan and England to make these colorful shirts. In the 1930s, Watermole's a manufacturer here, starts making printed fabrics that are um, have Hawaiian motifs. So you start getting really aloha fabrics for aloha wear. And then in the, um, that, that continues, but uh, we did have a really excellent exhibition in 2012 by our previous creator, Sarah Oka, called Board, Short, Board Shorts. And in the, in the 1960s, I mean, you didn't go to the store and buy shorts all the time. They were still made. And so this was actually made by a company called H. Miura on the North Shore of, of Oahu, and they're engineered to be very practical. They're actually tapered to fit on the waist. The buttons are on the inside. There's a little pocket for your car key that you can pin it in. So when you lay on the board, it doesn't scratch your surfboard or fall off if should you get wiped out. But you would go into the store, get measured, and then have the shorts made. And so there's a, the owner 
would not part with them because these are the records of all these surfers and their measurements to make their clothing. They've stayed with the family, but there are all these records of sizes of different people who surfed to make these board shorts. Wow, that's amazing. That's like, so, okay, so that reminds me of any number of tailors or makers I, living in Los Angeles. I think about, uh, you know, when celebrities go to have things made, they, they get measured once and then a form is built and they go back to the same tailor over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and uh, unless they change size, so that way, and that and the tailor or the maker keeps those things very very secret and very private and controlled. This is fascinating. Yeah, yeah there, I, I actually heard- Where's about, the little pocket? Is it on the inside of the shorts or is it tucked in the waistband? I see it up on the waistband. Oh, I see it there. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. that's awesome. And with that, I'm also starting to try and acquire um, 20th century Hawaiian fashion. So. You saw images of the holoku previously, so this is like the contemporary version of the holoku. So now this actually got princess seems a little more faded, but it is um, floor length. This one actually has a train and long sleeves, and so this is what you would see maybe um, a woman wearing for a wedding, or performing hula, or some other special occasion. And so this is just a, a recent acquisition that was just acquired. So stay tuned. Is that made of crushed picture. velvet? What is that made of? It's actually cotton brocade. Oh. It looks like crushed velvet. Oh, fantastic. So I um, look, look forward to an exhibition in the next couple of years on, on Aloha Wear and Hawaiian fashion. Reason to come visit. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, I know this is just the tip of the iceberg of the collection that you have. Um, in our meetings before, you talked about um, other collection, other um, especially from Asia, um, other objects of dress that you have. What are some of the other highlights that you would like to share with us? Uh, we have a, a, a pretty sizable collection of kimono, about 300. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so they, they range um, um, at least early 19th century and earlier to contemporary. Um, a lot of Art Deco, we have some thematic ones. There was actually one I was thinking about putting out that actually have, has a, the theme of an a, a Olympics um, from maybe about 100 years ago. So, that's amazing. Okay, um, I have tons of questions, and we have one from Marcy Froelich. Um, what are some of the challenges with conserving feather cakes? They are so beautiful. Um, they, they are difficult. We we try and handle them as little as possible. We actually do have mounts for them, like rigid mounts, and they just kind of get stored on the mounts. Um, there's actually also protocols that we follow too. So usually the yellow are the, you're more high ranking, and the more color, you know, the, so the solid yellow cape actually goes on the top. And as for protocols, they shouldn't be stored lower than, than your waist. So um, as far as shelves and, and who they get stored next to. Um, but for the most part, we they are mounted on, on a, on a um, fabric backing. So the capes are actually small bunches of feathers, usually about three, tied to a netting. And so the netting is the backing and we'll have the netting resting on fabric and then underneath that a rigid material and that's how we'll transport them we leave them kind of intact you you can vacuum them um if if necessary but for the most part um we just kind of um keep them very stable and you know there are um practitioners that that still make feather feather work today um but it's, it's very hard to source the historic feathers they're much much smaller than what we're using today but for the most part we just we do keep them on rigid backing for transport and storage. Wow, that's amazing. So, so um, I just want to be clear. So, uh, if if I were wearing a feathered cape, which let me tell you that would be a dream, um, uh, it would be the net that would be kind of the lining that it's tied yes. to. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so this is a very uh, very fine fishing net. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, <clears throat> Um, okay, so we have a few more questions. Do you have anything from, oh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce um, her name, Queen uh, Luli Okolani or Duke uh, Kahanamuku? Please correct my pronunciation. 
So we don't we don't have anything directly associated with Queen Lilliwool Palani. Um, Ilani Palace does. You know, we are an art museum, and we do have other collecting institutions on the island. So you know, we, there are resources out there. Um, we don't have anything that direct that's really directed to uh, Queen Lilliwool Palani. Um, as far as Duke Kahanamoku, um, we do have a few items from his line because he actually did have a line of aloha wear, like some shirts. He, he, he branded his name out, um, but we don't have anything directly um, associated with uh, Duke Kahanamoku, just on the um, tangent, tangentially. Yeah. Um, another question from Jennifer Dean. What are the benefits of displaying quilts on a slant board? Quilts on the slant one it's very it's much easier to install and it's it's much better for the quilt as it uh, distributes the weight. Um, most people who display quilts nowadays will either have a sleeve on the back at the top or on the top so it hangs down. Um, that does distribute the weight all the way across the top. But if it's on a slant board or flat, the weight is distributed along the entire back. Um, Usually when we'll hang quilts on a wall, you do want to still have a barrier between the wall and the quilt. So you might have you know, muslin or mylar or something else. But if it's on a slant board, the slant board can be lined or faced with fabric. And then the quilt can be attached to that. And we'll still put a, um, a hook and loop fastener at the top to hold it in place. But there's enough friction between the lining fabric and, and the back of the quilt that keeps it from moving. And so it, it's fully supported and um, much less stress and weight on the uh, quilt supports. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, another question. Um, when I was in Hawaii, I saw some dog tooth necklaces at the Bishop Museum. Does the museum have any of these? And was there a specific meaning behind them? So I don't have any dog tooth necklaces. I do have some made uh, Lady of Palao, which is the, the one from the lead. But dog tooth necklaces are usually. Um, um, I'll say um, part of hula, so they're actually kind of like the, uh, the bells or the um, noise making instrument that you might wear on an ankle for um, doing hula or dance. So it's part of the regalia for uh, it can be part of the regalia for a dancer. Oh wow, fascinating! So it makes sort of a clicking sound, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, uh, another comment is, I love the fabric covered slant boards for the ex exhibition of flat textiles. Speaking as a conservator here, thank you, Meg, uh, uh, for your comment. So yeah, that looks really lovely and interesting. And it doesn't seem to take up much more space. Um, I mean, it's a little bit more, more, but not, not tons. Yeah. I mean, there, there are better you know, ideals. You do want to have some kind of slant, so it does take up more, more space instead of just flat on the wall. but. Um, yeah, the, the, the more gradual the slope, the better, but then if it's gradual and it's not behind glass, then you end up with more dust or particulates landing on the quilt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, so what are, um, what are things that you are seeking right now to add to your collection? I'm, I'm actually looking for, um, 20th century aloha wear, personally, just to kind of grow that because we don't have a lot here. I mean, we have, you know, we have kimono, we have Chinese court robes, uh, we have some, uh, uh, some Philippine textiles and a lot of Indonesian textiles. And it, it, I think it'd be nice to have just a representation of Hawaiian fashion. And so that's what I'm looking at right now, just acquiring, and not just aloha shirts, just there's other things out there as well, from, from coats to other dresses. And, uh, not too much contemporary designers. There's kind of a, a gap. If you look at uh, people who collect Aloha shirts, it's usually post-World War II. It's trying to find those 30s and 40s ones that really aren't marked, or even 20s ones where they're maybe home, home sewn or made by a tailor. See, I want you to license those prints so I can like reprint the fabric and make because that the print the the slide that you showed those prints were stunning. I love the scale of them and the dynamic qualities. They were just really really beautiful. Um, so that that breadfruit print that I showed by Elsie Dodd that Watermoles had made was actually in uh, production for about twenty years, and it was used on on upholstery to uh, beachwear. Wow, 
It's beautiful. It's a gorgeous print. Okay, we have a bunch more questions. Um, how many feather capes does the museum collection have? We have five. We have five. And one is actually kind of a um, early 20th century art deco style. It's actually, it's made out of feathers. It is Hawaiian, but it's more of a, a fashion cape than royal regalia. So in, in the care of them, do you still engage some of the traditional um, uh, makers of the feather capes who still make them to help with the conservation? Or um, are you engaged with that community in any way, shape, or form? I, I, I am engaged with that, the, 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 that community of practitioners and, um, and protocol. Um, fortunately, we haven't had to do anything to them yet, so that's, that's very good. Um, they're quite stable. I mean, um, the, the base layer is olana, which is a natural fiber and one of the strongest natural materials. And, you know, feather, feathers are pretty stable. Um, it's a lot of the 20th century feather capes, which were made for like uh, funerals or, or, or short-term regalia, were made out of dyed feathers. And they actually have faded. They, they've gone away. So you, you look at them, they may have been dyed chicken feathers. Or, uh, turkey feathers dyed um, yellow or green, and, and they're white now. Um, mm. the, the older natural natural color feathers uh, are much more color fast, and yeah, it's just just managing their exposure. Right, right. Um, another question is: Do you have a kappa collection from the 18th century? We do have kappa. We do have kappa. Um, we did see one kappa moi, and we do have some contemporary kappa, but we actually have um, some kappa swatches and samples, as well as kilohana or top sheets, so they are decorated from um, pre-contact, so 18th century up until 19th century. So they have a nice representation can, of white cloth. Can you, uh, so kappa is bark cloth. I was gonna say, can you elaborate again for um, for any viewers? Yeah, so kappa is bark, and we actually have bark cloth from other um, uh, Pacific nations as well. Oh, what have you found is much of a difference between um, the the techniques of making the kappa from one pacific nation to another to another so um they're mostly made of paper mulberry or lalke and it's the inner bark and it's very much like um japanese paper the, the bark mm -hmm. paper and the difference is in some of the techniques and the fineness hawaiian bark cloth is pretty fine and they'll tend to um leave it in one direction so when they open up the inner bark and, and it, it's pounded or felted out, and then it's, it it's expands as, as it's pounded, and you'll get widths, and then they'll overlap them. Um, some nations, when they overlap, sometimes they'll cross the grain to reinforce it. So you end up with a thicker, more uh, very sturdy, but stiffer bark cloth. And then as well as patching the holes. So um, some countries like to prune the tree, so that when you split the bark off, it's just uh, intact, and some of them will have holes, so the branches are allowed to grow, and then you have holes that you have to patch. And they're either glued or sewn, so it, it does vary on, on the fineness and the direction of the fibers in the kappa. So how, um, so is there a glue that adheres them to it, or is it just water that felts them together? So most times it's just felting, so you would overlap overlap segments and then pound them together and then as they dried it you felt it together um, sometimes for repair they will glue or stitch it together and that's 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 where you have to worry about the insects because the insects like to eat the glue or whatever the material oh are. so they're not they're not attracted to the bark the the cloth they're attracted to the glue they will eat they will eat through and they will eat they will eat around but if there's glue they're more likely to eat the glue first yeah. That's fascinating. Um, uh, are there, obviously there must be, are there still makers in Hawaii that are yes. making? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, um, the one kappa in the case, um, which was kind of like the color chart of the artist, she only passed away just recently. And she taught a lot. And her students are now teaching the next generation of kappa makers. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Oh my God. Uh, I'm learning so much today. This is awesome. This is why I love doing this show because I, I never know what's going to happen. And I get to learn so much and I get to talk with really cool people about really cool things. Um, 
So uh, in our previous conversation, you talked about the dress behind you on the form. Can you also uh, tell me about that again? So this is roughly 1970s, and I actually just picked it up um, a little while ago. And so how, how I was talking about the holoku being the full dress with the sleeves and the usually a collar, I, it, but it's always long, you know, full length or with the train. And then the mu is shorter, and so that actually means that it's cut sometimes without sleep. And so the hybrid that comes out in the 20th century is the holo mu. And so this one is actually sleeveless, but it does have fit. It has the princess seams, and it actually has the watto back that gathers back, but no train. That's fantastic. I love it. I love that hybridization of the cut and that. And the print of that dress is just amazing. It's gorgeous. I still have to do some research on it, but I did. I could date the label. So. Where did you find that? There was um, the our downtown art center had a uh, Halloween thrift sale, and I think it was Hawaii Pacific University's costume department and whatever else people in the community had. And I saw this treasure, and I was like, I'm just, I'm just picking that up. That's awesome. I I I. I... In all fairness, I kind of would love a Watto back Mumu. I mean, who doesn't want one? Who does not want one of those? Let's just, let's all be honest here. <laughs> um, that is amazing. Um, um, and how would someone come about to do research at your institution? Um, just email us. I mean, we do have a library, an art library and archives. Um, but yeah, if you have any specific questions, just um, contact us. I mean. I'm not the only creator, so there are other areas of focus you want to not just look at textiles, but because I have a workroom, we do make um, um, appointments for researchers to come in and look at the works in person. Excellent. Awesome. Tori, thank you so much. This has just been a delight and a pleasure. And um, I, I've only been to Honolulu once, and now I have reason to come many more times. Uh, so, I, I, you know, after hosting this webinar, it's like, I just need to chart a, you know, a travel path all over the country so I can meet everyone that I've been able to Zoom with. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, so I would like to thank our guest, Tori Latila, um, for his effort and for this fantastic uh, program today. And thank you all for attending. Uh, please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure to make sure that you hear about our upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. Lastly, if you enjoyed today's content, uh, we implore you to make a small, a large, and obscenely enormous contribution to help us keep this content free for all. Um, and there is a link for uh, on, on your screen um, or in the chat box. So, um, Tori, thank you once again so much. This was really, really delightful. And Tori, thank you for attending so many of the conversations on dress. Um, you're you so regularly attend. Can, can I can I say thank you to my my professor in from college? So I joined CSA as a student membership award recipient in my senior year at university, and that was through Dr. Linda Arthur, who's now retired from University of Washington. So I've maintained my membership since college. So thank you, Dr. Arthur. Thank you. And thank you for your continued membership. Thank you all so much. Have a good night.